a board, a citizen of the Chalk Foundation, and then there's through a treaty to 1924, I'm granted a citizenship. It's very interesting because most people don't know that. Most uh, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> so, the reason why this is important is that as internationals, we're internationals. We practice it every day. In Oklahoma, we have 67 tribes, 39 that have treaties with the United States, which means we have 67 indigenous languages. How many of your countries have that? I think of a lot. Yeah, well, India? India and China, I know definitely, I guess, on that. How about yours? Huh? Well, India and China, you definitely beat us on that one. And we have a joke amongst the, amongst the Indians here with the other Indians. We go, is it daughter feather? <laughs> yeah. But the reason why this is relevant to the art is this. My art is neo hieroglyphic. What that means is, my tradition, we do hieroglyphs. And so what I'm, instead of describing something that's something historical in the past, we're very much right now in a period of our life after five centuries that we're able to, able to breathe new air. So the artwork reflects it. So my subjects are people that are living. Things that are here and now. Not just the Indian country, but it, you know, the whole gamut. And I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. And so in that sense, it conforms to tradition, but it lives in the current and it looks to the future. And so I am very grateful that the theme of this consortium has been on trying to be relevant, lifelong scholarship, and that, you know, do something that's non-traditional. Well, you know, and as marketing people, when you look around and you want good business, it's amazing because we're at that point in Oklahoma where the biggest emerging markets in Oklahoma are amongst the tribes. To where my tribe now, and these are the Department of Oklahoma Commerce numbers, not ours. We are, our annual budget is three times the state of Oklahoma's. The Chickasaw Nation budget is three times the state of Oklahoma's. The Cherokees is three times the state of Oklahoma's. You put us together, we employ more people in gas and oil in Oklahoma. Chickasaw Nation alone employs 10,000 people in Oklahoma. And amongst all of those tribes, the ratio of employment is for every one native and seven non-native Oklahomans employed. So when you start thinking about the future international, as you look to your careers, keep us in mind. Because we employ people too. <laughs> all right, so with that, I'm going to introduce Russ Tall Chief. Russ Tall Chief is a very close friend of mine, a brother in arms. Hey, Russ. Russ. There he is. Russ, Osage, Grand Horse. What I like about this is, and what I want people to be very, you'll be very free about this is, Russ, before coming back to Oklahoma, was at the Smithsonian over film projects and such, as a film critic, a playwright, author, other things, you know, an actor. But you know, in Indian country, we're allowed to wear multiple hats. So the music you're going to hear tonight is a trend that's happening throughout all of Indian country. And when I say all of Indian country, you have 536, 556 tribes in the United States that are recognized with treaties. In Canada, 636. And they are coming back. And so the music that we're experiencing along with our culture and with the resurgence is something that's aggressive, it's very edge. And so at this point, what we're going to talk, he's going to dance a little bit and kind of show how the tradition is merging with these very new sounds. And uh, now you can play it. <laughs>
not what you expected to hear, was it? It's definitely not what you expected to hear, but you know, this is sort of a trend that's happened within Indian country that, you know, the music that we're, you know, we went to school and everywhere else, you know, like normal schools, and we like hip hop, we like trance, we like techno, we like metal and ska, whatever else. But it's just, we want it in our own language. I think there are a lot of people here who understand what I mean. Like if you're French, one of the greatest like R&B uh, uh, singers, like for me, is Saint Clair. He's an amazing guy, but keeps it true. So what we're going to do tonight is, um, and please, the microphone's here. So if you have a question, whether it's not just about the art, but something that's culturally relevant, like what's going on, you know, feel free to come up and or you know, yell it out, talk. Your people are marking people. That's like the talk. I mean. <laughs> so I've been led to believe. So, uh, so what we're going to do is have powwow. Not our ceremonies, but our powwow. It's very competitive, and so what what judges are going to do is they're going to mark on a few key moves, a few, few key positions and stances that a dancer makes, and. Yeah, they're looking at. So what we're gonna do is Russ has kindly agreed in a very busy month because this is their ceremonial month for their dances amongst the Osage, which means that amongst all the um, you know, here in Oklahoma, the three weekends they're gathering, and this is the one weekend that they're not and he's agreed to be here. He's gonna strike a pose, so to speak. And uh, I'm gonna sketch it up and we're gonna pick one out of those. And that's going to be the one that I'm going to develop tonight. And uh, I believe that's the one that's going to go to someone, whoever wins the rap, which is kind of cool. So, all right. So which one do we want to do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you notice. And you guys are pretty laid back, so. No, feel free if you want to look, you know, you can walk up here, I mean, it's not gonna like, freak me out. I mean, I did a three year series on drag queens out of the clubs, so you can't possibly freak me out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want the sky? Yeah. Now, the reason why I do the one line is I like the idea that it forces me to think a little bit more clearly, which is a rarity. And it forces me to, to try to focus on what's really important that I'm looking at and then to articulate it quickly, which I think we all do as we grow with certain expertise. We're no longer, we've sort of absorbed the technical things and we can get on to the real deep, the real meat of it. Now, one of the things I gotta tell you about Russ is when uh, the, the National Museum of the American Indian was opened up, he and his father, he was head dancer and father was actually a head man, wasn't he? MC. MC, so, uh, that's a pretty big deal in Indian country. So I'm very fortunate to get Russ to pose for me. <laughs> and no, that doesn't make him a poser. I'm surprised you're all being kind of quiet out there. How's that? Can you see that a little bit? Now, all right, so this one, I'm gonna rest a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, strike that pose right there. <laughs> Oh yeah, that one right there, you know, the baseball pose. The all important Indian baseball pose. 
<laughs> so, does anybody have any questions? Come on. I know that there are, if you're from Europe, and you're from Northern Europe, I know that the impact by Carl May and an author there. No questions, no comments, no complaints? Liars. Better. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, you like, come on up and grab the mic, come on. All right. Good. <laughs> well, you have to ask the dancer because I'm trusting. Like he's he is Osage. I'm chocolate. I was just about to turn. It's a shift. It's a transition. And so, and I mean, this is exactly it. I mean, so you ready? All right. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Whichever one, you strike it, I'll draw it. Alright, can I turn it the other way? Yeah. 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 Oh, what was that pose? What's the point of it? Yeah, that one. Alright. I'm locked right here. Okay, can you shift a little bit like that? A little bit oscillate more of, to where that's actually going that direction. No, to where your stick is going that direction. Yeah, yeah, that's better for me. Now, one of the things that's interesting right now is that within our respective nations, as we're growing and the arts are coming back too, we're going to be, if everything goes well, we're going to be in Europe doing some artwork later on this year, sort of commemorating how our vocation, so to speak, went international. Our artwork went international back in 1928 with a group of Kawa artists going to France and then going to Prague and a few other places. And we are going to go back over, kind of tracing those footsteps. And Russ is actually an authority on that. And here we go, another one. How's that? Now this one, that this particular pose, this stick is has how many have heard counting coup? The expression of counting coup. No one? Okay. Counting coup was a, was amongst the, the, the planes in it a way in which a, a superior warrior would show mercy and shame an inferior one. Rather than slay them on a the battlefield. I'm so good that I can knock you upside your head with my stick. It's that sort of thing. And so, in that sort of pose, he's identifying. He's looking out going, oh, it's going to be you. Or it's going to be you. Or it's going to be, that's what he's doing. So, when you're dancing, the dance, dances have a lot, most of the men have a lot to do quite often about either hunting or really about scouting and war. And so, a lot about war. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because like in my tribe, most people think of what we do in business as being just gaming. Which, the only reason why the tribes are in gaming is because we're not able to leverage our fixed assets through trees because of trees. Which means you need a very big ATM. That's called a casino. <laughs> and interesting thing this year, we're going to strike another one. You want to do the kick? Yes. Keep my toe down. Yeah, just keep your toe down. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I like this one. I'm going to come back and do that. 
<laughs> That's when you know someone's enough. started getting really worried because they wanted to continue to travel, they loved to dance, and so they beefed it up and kicked it up and started sharing their outfits. They started uh, borrowing, like somebody had a really cool bustle, they'd be like, can I borrow that for this dance? And somebody had a really cool headdress, he'd be like, can I borrow that? And so they started borrowing from each other's outfits and the dances became more and more and more and more elaborate. Well, Bustles were uh, an evolution of what was called a crow bell. And it was a bustle in the back, but it was still rooted in warfare, which all these dances are, and it represented the battlefield. There's two sticks that come out from the back. Those represent arrows in the bodies. It had wolf tail and crow feathers. They're associated with carnage anytime there was a battle. There would be wolves circling and crows flying above, and once the battle was over, they would go and eat the bodies. Then the trails on the back, red trails that are like this broadcloth, which is wool, 
in red meant that the person had killed in battle, and a green one meant they'd been to battle but they hadn't killed, and every feather that was in it represented a, a person they killed. So, um, those muscles became more and more and more elaborate, and when the wars basically stopped, the Indian wars, and we moved in World War One to uh, you know, I think the Korea, Vietnam, the, a lot of Indian people joined the military because it was just in their blood. And then I'll interject right there, right now, even in, at this current time, amongst the regular society of Americans, for every 100 people, one person will join the military. Within Indian country, it's one out of every 10. And then if you go into special operations, special forces, the Indian country accounts for almost a third by number. And these dances are still war dances. And um, what I did is a war dance, and I'm what's called a tail dancer. So we are a little bit more elaborate than the straight dancers in our style. And when we kick, we are symbolically kicking over the bodies on the battlefield to make sure that they're dead. And then if they're not, we kill them. But it's all symbolic now in our dance. So, um, the, the bustles became more elaborate and became two, which are the fancy dancers that a lot of people have probably seen, uh, either dancing or in pictures. They're probably the most elaborate. Um, they're a new evolution that is very much a mid 20th century evolution of dance that began right here in Oklahoma and has spread all over the country. So when we dance in all these various styles of dance, there's brass dance, chicken dance, and um, the, the duck and dive, like whenever I duck, is um, a duck and dive dodging cannonballs. So it's all, you know, it all goes back to war. And what judges look for when they're looking at these different styles of dance is- I like that that you're rooted in that tradition, that they can identify your style, first of all, that you are dancing a southern straight style or you're dancing a grass dance. We're starting to blend a little bit more with our styles. They, they're starting to overlap a little bit. I did some grass dance moves in there. And, um, you know, unless you know those styles, you don't know what I was doing. But um, the, the judges look, because they know, what you're dancing, and so they want to know that you're dancing that style, and that you have an individual sort of thing that you're bringing to it that is distinct. They look at your outfit, and they want to make sure you're put together. There's a lot of good dancers that um, you know are not put together. Judges take off for that. And there's a lot of really put together dancers that can't dance, and so you know it, it sort of balances out, but. The, the winners rise to the surface very clearly and very evidently and there's no question about it unless there's, you know, somebody's cousin or, you know, relative that's judging, which happens too. A lot. Because we're all related. I'm <laughs> because, not related to Gary. Because, you know, in Indian country, we don't have a gene pool. We got a gene puddle. Yeah. I mean, it's a, I mean, it, I'm, in Indian country, especially like chocolate country, I'm surprised we don't have like three-headed Choctaw kids running around. But it, it's, oh, in Indian country, we do, we love comedy. We have to. I mean, everything about, I mean, how else will we have survived this long? We can't be terribly sardonic too long. I mean, we've got five centuries of this unless we, We've got to. We practice with the other stuff, though. Yeah, we, we do. Yeah. I even have the I even have the tear. <laughs> that that's only good for those who are you know here in the United States. It it was a commercial done in the 70s and then yeah, right. very nice food. Yeah. But anybody got a question thus far? Come on, you got questions? Don't lie to me. What's the various parts of the regalia? This is an eagle feather. Uh, it's a wing, full wing of eagle, and. Um, this is acoustic, we talked a little bit about that. Um, my outfit is wool, it's broadcloth, and I'm sweating up a storm, but I'm not complaining because this week I'll be doing this twice a day outside 
at our staff and it was at 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. on the day. It's like two days in football. And, um, yeah, I noticed you were you know, pulling up that belt a little bit more this, this week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've already lost about 15 pounds <laughs> since June 1st. And that's interesting to note because if you Still were to go, to go, if you were to go to where these clan dances happen, it's like stepping back in time because they've been gathering together for years and years. I mean, I don't know how many years. About a hundred. Our drum is going to last about hundred and thirty years. And and what that means is when they gather. You know, these are families that are gathering. These are, you know, family reunions, but they're also extended families come out, and it's a way that people keep connected. And these are parts of Oklahoma that effectively, economically, are, you know, without the tribes, are don't have much of a future. And it's an incredible experience to go out to a place where instead of seeing like cattle crossing signs, you see buffalo crossing signs. You think I'm joking? I mean, it's like you drive up there and it's like a cattle crossing sign. No, it's a buffalo. <laughs> we have straight answer crossing signs. <laughs> we do. Somebody made because we're always crossing the road. It's true. Um, this is porcupine hair. Roach. We used to have our hair cut like this. We'd shave it back and then flip our hair up like that. Eagle feather in the top, representing our connection to God. Um, the eagle flies highest in the sky, so the symbolism of the eagle is that uh, closeness to God. And then on my back is an otter hide. And that's a uh, river otter. And they're really playful. I don't know if any of you have seen river otters and sea otters, but they're just a riot. And so they symbolize playfulness, and that's what we do when we dance. You know, it's, it's not always serious. We bust a move and have fun, and you know, try to look stoic. But and um, it's like that first song we were playing that you're dancing to. That was a 49 song. It was a love song. Yeah, social sure love song. I mean, if you're listening to the to the lyrics, it is going. You know, talking about that Indian girl over there. They have the English like, lyrics. Hey, look at that Indian girl. So, <laughs> yeah, but. You know, what's fascinating, too, is where we, where we fit is Russ, is Russ and I have, are part of a, a sort of a generation that is, you know, you struggle with trying to maintain you know, your traditions, and then we're both in the middle of downtown Oklahoma City. We're both in the middle of what we would call the Dhamma Society's world, and very comfortable with that. But it's it's one of those things where I think a lot of people in this room, especially from other cultures, and I would think too, because of the, the subject of marketing, the, the question of influence by Western society over the marketing and how that works elsewhere, this has got to be something that you guys deal with too. So. Can we do a drawing with me sitting down? Yeah. <laughs> All right. This floor is really slick. I uh, kind of had to soften it up a little bit here. But in the dirt, if you ever get a chance to go to a powwow, you get a little bit more traction. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. And plus, you know, the longer you dance into the night, the more warm you get. I start screaming and whooping. Which is actually kind of when it's about midnight, you start hearing that wood around the prairie. That that's just quite terrifying. Um, do you, I think I've finished my alpha my, my moccasins are deer on the top and buffalo on the bottom. And I've been dancing so much right now it's just got a duct tape sole. Totally dance the soul of my well, moccasins last week. So I literally resold the both of them. Duct tape, traditional. <laughs> very traditional. <laughs> um, and I think these shorts underneath. 
<laughs> What's really funny too is you go out to the powwows and you have little kids going around and they have beat it into their regalia Elmo from Sesame Street or Dora or something like that, which I think is absolutely appropriate because that's where we're at right now, where the tribes and people are trying to figure out, you know, where that identity lies and preserve what's what needs to be preserved, conserve what needs to be conserved. But just like every society, not everything needs to be brought with us. And that's a struggle. And especially for Oklahoma, which in 20 years, with airways and just the economic impact of the tribes, it's going to look so different to the rest of the United States. And I think that that's a pretty cool thing. So especially the internationals here, you should come back. Well, um... I had the privilege of doing my master's at Bemidji State in Minnesota, and I lived on the Ojibwe Reservation. I lived between those three Ojibwe Reservations, and it was a great experience for me because I had never been around an exclusively, like, one tribal community. And coming from Oklahoma, where we had 67 tribes relocated here, 39 left, the others went home, uh, but still have a presence here in a lot of ways that made me appreciate and also kind of understand the really profound sort of identity that we have in Oklahoma as a one state, many nations. And that identity is what makes us unique in the country. We are one of the highest per capita populations in the country as far as uh, Indian people in a state. And I say one of, I've heard that we are the, we have the most Indians per capita of any state, but I, I always hesitate to say that because you never know, we do another count, the Navajos have been busy and there's other things to me. But you know, we definitely have the most number of tribes in Oklahoma. And I'm the director of arts and exhibitions for the American Indian Cultural Center and Museum. That's under construction in Oklahoma City at the junction of I-35 and I-40. Well, we went through a full branding process recently with the Plocker Cohen in New York City, and the identity complexity was a huge challenge for this branding firm to really understand how we should market ourselves as an institution because we are one state in a nation. So what, what does that mean? Well, uh, yeah, we can be a one-stop shop for people that want to come through on Route 66 on the Brandon Harley and, you know, stop in and kind of get a taste of a whole bunch of different Indian cultures. But we have 125,000 square feet, so how do we do justice to all the tribes in Oklahoma? And how do we present that to the world in, in some sort of a package? And you as marketing people can probably appreciate that even more than I can because we have a one person marketing staff. I'm a one person exhibitions development staff. We're, you know, we're still six years out from even opening. We're just, just the building's done on the outside. You can go by and see it if you guys go into the city at all. We had a meeting there at the visitor center and it was some, some group from this convention, conference. And so we've been talking about this for about a year. And if you have any ideas, feel free to let me know because it's still very much unsolved right now. It's undetermined exactly how we're going to present ourselves because it has only been done on a hemispheric so, which is the National Museum of American Indian, where I was from 95 to 2001. I was at the New York facility, though, before the Washington, D.C. facility opened. And we had a collection that represented North Central and South America, and so our identity was even more complex, and so I keep trying to reassure our staff that we have a big challenge, but Enemy I had it even bigger as a challenge. And so we're trying to figure out 
how best to tell those stories and without being redundant, how to not change history, but perspectives on history and provide that first person native voice in the exhibits as opposed to that third person uh, historical perspective because we are very much living cultures and this is a really good example of, of how the cultures continue to evolve. Because what Eric was doing began on high paintings, petroglyphs, pictograms, and then moved into fine art in the 1920s with the Kyle Five that Derek mentioned, and uh, that we continue right here with Derek's work as an Oklahoma contemporary native artist. And we have a play, uh, Derek's helped me on this play that I wrote about the Kyle Five, and we performed it a couple of times here, and hopefully we'll take it to Paris in November and Prague as a part of that trip. So we want to exhibit his work and other contemporary Native artists' work while also showing them the genesis of contemporary Native art, which is primarily my focus. My brain doesn't really go beyond about 1930 and creative sorts of experiments. But um, in terms of contemporary art, <laughs> We, we want to create opportunities for artists like Eric, and uh, hopefully we'll be at the Grand Palais in Paris November 22nd through the 27th. Well, you know, I want to say thank you for I'll close your remarks. I know that you had someone here from uh, Belgium. And so what's interesting there is the thing that goes on there about Flemish, or French. You know, it's something that's very much alive in our own conversations of identity. And I know the internationals here, we have that same sort of thing and, and argument that I know how it is internally about that. And so I appreciate and I applaud the fact that your themes this year are concurrent with our, our values meaning that the struggles that we go through. And quite frankly, in our tribe, we would never have achieved what we have without outside PhD students coming in from overseas, researching, and validating what we do as independent voices. So I would challenge you to think that way. Thank you.